Right. I don't have to start again, do I? No. <laughs> um, so let's start with a quote from um, Terry Eagleton. Some of you may know his name. Um, who is actually moving towards faith in quite specific ways and I think is a really interesting writer. But he's responding to some of the uh, late work of the so-called uh, atheists who have made a frontal attack on Christianity. And he talks about Dawkins, and he talks about Hitchens, and he talks about a number of them. But here's, I think, a really interesting quote from Terry Eagleton. Life for Richard Dawkins would seem to divide neatly down the middle between things you can prove beyond all doubt and blind faith. Okay, so those, that phrase, blind faith, is a, is a phrase that Dawkins uses a lot. Eagleton um, concludes that what Dawkins fails to see is that all the most interesting stuff goes on in neither of these places. Okay. So I'm interested when I'm with people who take me on for my Christian faith. Um, happened actually very recently in sitting in the pub or a coffee shop or whatever. Uh, and they will say, well, I need proof, I need evidence. There's a classic modernist approach to <clears throat> what faith is about. And I, I will often now have a habit of turning the question around and say, well, before we do that, I can, I'd love to talk about that, but tell me two things that have changed your life that you really know. There's normally then a very long silence. So I say, well, tell me one thing you really know. Okay. And uh, as likely as not, that the content of that one thing is normally in the realm of personal relationships. It's about love. It's about children, it's about parents, it's about my loved ones, those precious to me. So, of course, again, what Taylor says is really significant here. Our culture tells us that that's not a valid answer to the question, what can I really know? Because we're stuck in a, still, a modernist, the shadow of modernity, which says that certain things only can be really known. And yet, in practice, what Charles Taylor calls the imminent frame continually bleeds out because we don't live that way. What we really know is actually stuff which, in terms of modernity, can't be proved. So there's something of that dichotomy still at work, <clears throat> I think, in our culture. So on the one hand, you've got what we might describe as enlightenment objectivism. And we could go to any number of sources for that. Dawkins has a view on that, but let's go to a professional philosopher, very well known in his day, A.J. Ayer. I believe in science, that is, I believe that a theory about the way the world works is not acceptable and that it is, unless it is confirmed by the facts, note the use of the language. And I believe that the only way to discover what the facts are is by empirical observation. Okay? That's a sort of classic, scientific, methodical view of what truth is about. Now, we've also got, on the other hand, what we might describe as postmodern or late modern subjectivism, which is a kind of a despair, it's partly a reaction against the kind of imminent frame, as Charles Taylor describes it, of modernity, but is, is much more centered upon the individual. It's about creation, it's about the subjective knowing state of individuals. And it's produced, as you will well know, um, all kinds of eruptions of mental insecurity amongst many of our contemporaries. Um, it's not a, an easy place to live in. Um, Zygmunt Bauman, who died recently, a very <clears throat> brilliant Polish uh, Jewish sociology, a sociologist, summed it up this way, nothing can be known for sure, and anything which is known can be known in a different way. One way of knowing is as good or as bad, and certainly as volatile and precarious as any other. So you've got this kind of caught between these almost two extremes, two facets of what knowing might be described to be about. And if you're in the business of talking to people about your faith, assuming you've got a faith, um, then you'll very quickly get into this kind of territory. Well, how do you know? How can you know? What is there to be known? What does it mean to know something? Now, it's into that um, area that Newbegin <clears throat> um, pitches his tent, as it were. Um, there are three photographs of Newbegin. One as a student, one as a a kind of middle-aged man and one as an elderly man. Um, if you know nothing about his life, he was uh, educated here in Cambridge at Queen's and then at Westminster College, and he went out to India in 1936 as a Church of Scotland missionary. Um, and he was very involved with the World Council of Churches. He edited their primary journal, the International Review of Mission, 
for many years. And then he returned from India in 1974 with his wife and basically caught trains and backpacked all the way back from Chennai or Madras across Europe and arrived back in England. And he said that culture shock hit him in Munich railway station for some strange reason. I don't know quite why that might be particularly the case, but that's what he says. <clears throat> um, he's an enormously influential figure um, in my discipline of missiology. Um, and his time's obituary kind of catches something of that. Described him as one of the foremost missionary statesmen of his generation and indeed is one of the outstanding figures on the world Christian stage in the second half of the 20th century. Um, I, I, I think it's difficult to underestimate his influence, but I, but I nonetheless think that he's actually a very neglected theologian. Okay, now let's think about theology for a moment. If we think about the, the method of theology, you will have thought, many of you, about this. You probably have your own views about this. Newbegin was unashamedly a... Um, a missionary theologian in the sense that he didn't think that theology was anything other ever than responding to the overflow of the character of God in reconciling love. So that all theology is a response to the way God is. Um, and, and unless one really understands that, theology always becomes either a, a human construction of one type or another, or it takes a kind of a, a different, if you like, a second level or a second order significance in the way the world works. So I'm not going to talk a great deal about that, but you may want to pick me up in questions afterwards. Um, so Newbegin, for Newbegin, theology is always a response to the being of God as God is and the overflow of love that comes out of the character of God. So Newbegin is always passionate about what that means in terms of our, app our apprehension of theology, what that theology leads to, the kind of relationships and connections that it makes, and so on and so forth. So there's something to maybe stick in your pipe and smoke um, as a method for theology. Now, where does Newbegin um, position himself in relation to this? <laughs> That's a nice little move, that, that PowerPoint move. Just have a look at that. <laughs> Just have a look at that. That's lovely. So if you take nothing else away from this, that... A lovely move to make. So, um, Newbegin's very clear about these two sides. Now, Newbegin, by the time post-modernity came into parlance, or you know, the kind of linguistic discourse, Newbegin was 81 when he first started talking about the postmodern, and he died when he was 89. So, this is really about the last eight years of his life. And if any of you are as active as Newbegin was in his 80s when you were in your 80s. Um, well, let's talk about myself. I'll be very, very grateful. An extraordinary mind to keep going. He was very aware of this, and his, his take on post-modernity, I think, therefore, is, is very significant. Now, on the one hand, he sees the division between these two ways of knowing. So, on the one hand, Enlightenment objectivism. Uh, Newbegin reads post-modernity through the work of Friedrich Nietzsche in the late uh, 19th century, in many ways the grandfather of the postmodern. And, and really latches on to Nietzsche's critique of Descartes' method, the Cartesian method, if you like, this idea that we are autonomous in our knowing. Um, and actually that critical doubt, as Newbegin describes it, uh, he says is very insecure. And many scholars have pointed that out. Uh, you may have come across works by, for example, Alistair MacIntyre, or indeed Charles Taylor himself, and any number of philosophers, Esther Meek, and so on and so forth, who, who point to the internal insecurity of a method which is about epistemological objectivism or the limits of that. Newbegin puts it this way. Doubt is not an autonomous activity. One can only rationally doubt a statement on the basis of something else which one believes to be true. That belief can, of course, also be doubted, but only on the basis of something else which is believed to be true. And so the critical principle begins to unravel and destroy itself. So I talk in terms of a, you know, a Cartesian spiral that actually doesn't give you security. And certainly in the world of Nietzsche, uh, if you follow the logic of that, it leads to what Nietzsche famously trumpeted as both, well, it's nihilistic. There's nothing, there's nothing you can, you know, there's nothing left to work with. Um, 
McIntyre interprets our contemporary culture as one which responds to that by saying we don't have any more secure truth foundations to work with, therefore a lot of our ethical discussions, we might add now a lot of our political discussions, are not based on premises which we're arguing are true in any sense, but simply on the basis of the manipulation of somebody else's feelings by shouting louder. And there's a lot one could say about that. Um, <clears throat> On the other hand, there's another good move. Uh, look at that. That's lovely, lovely. I hope you're appreciating this. I've mean, spent a lot of time on this. Um, Postmodernity for Newbegin, um, quote, simply tells a whole series of stories, none of which is the story. There is no meta-narrative. That's the famous phrase used by uh, Lyotard, the French postmodern philosopher. There are only the innumerable stories that people tell um, Post-modernity's main feature, he goes on, is the abandonment of any claim to know the truth in an absolute sense. Ultimate reality is not single, but it's diverse and it's chaotic. And if you've read anything around the kind of postmodern reaction against modernity, you'll know what that's about. So the question for Newbegin becomes something like this. Is pluralism, the existence of a number of different narratives within a postmodern frame, is it fatal to the claim to know the truth? Can there be affirmation of truth in a pluralist world? And if so, what does that mean? What does that look like? Now, I want to say to you, be careful about what you write in essays in your early career, because I'll take you back to the first essay, which um, is in the archive from Newbegin. He wrote it in this city at Westminster College in 1936. Um, and uh, so he was a graduate student, he was training in theology, and he was uh, preparing to go out to India. And he wrote a, an essay entitled Revelation. It's 33 pages, I think, long. Uh, you can still access it. Um, but notice the way that Newbegin starts, because actually Newbegin's beginning points are clear right from the start of his career. In a preliminary consideration of the subject of revelation, we may fairly say, he says, that the central importance ascribed to revelation in Christianity depends upon two beliefs about the nature of the world. Firstly, the belief that the meaning of the world is personal. It's quite a striking statement to make. The meaning of the world is personal. For if the final meaning of the world is less than personal, then it is best understood by those methods of skepticism and experiment which are the requisites of the scientific inquiry, but which would be complete destruction of any personal understanding. So Newbegin plays with that idea that unless you bring the personal into our understanding of epistemology, how we know what we know, then, of course, we ought to be satisfied with an enlightenment answer, which is depersonalized. It's about you know, objective truth that we can point to out there. It's not part of us, in one sense. We're finding out stuff about the nature of the world. So, the meaning of the world is personal. Second, the belief that the meaning of, the ma of man's... He was writing in the 30s, so excuse the language. Secondly, the belief that the meaning of man's life is in fellowship. If it were otherwise, we should not understand the immensely significant fact that the revelation which is the key to our highest blessedness does not descend to us straight from heaven, but has to reach us passed from hand to hand of our fellow men along the chain of a historic community. Now, Newbegin there is making a very straightforward observation about how Christian faith works. It's, it's born by a tradition of believing individuals, women and men who know and own and believe in Jesus Christ. And Newbegin's epistemology, let's make the case right from the start, is unashamedly, I think, between either the modern or the postmodern extremes. It takes, if you like, a, um, the middle space. It's actually a third space, I think. Um, so in, in the light of the kind of framework that we thought about earlier, uh, Newbegin's answer in this realm is to think very carefully about the knowledge of persons. And that, for Newbegin, starts because that's the way he comes to faith. 
He comes to faith by the revelation of God's purposes for the world in him and for him. And right from the earliest days, so this is the 30s, as you follow Newbegin's track on epistemology, his theology is inescapably personal. Okay. Now again, that's quite, I think, a challenge. I think the doctrine of revelation has fallen into dissuetude, into ignorance in, over the past some decades. So uh, theology often takes a kind of second order kind of uh, position and makes statements about certain aspects of the character, but at third position, as it were. Newbegin is always inescapably and uh, unavoidably personal. He's, he's, he's here, he says, because God has revealed himself to him. And that therefore characterizes his theology. But Newbegin says that actually that's the way the scriptures talk about knowing. Okay, obviously the Bible didn't know anything about modernity or post-modernity. If you turn to the Bible, he puts it in some lectures he gave in India in 1968. The basic ideal of knowledge in the Bible is the mutual knowledge of persons. Here, if you ask the question, how do you know? The answer is found in the experience of personal relationship, in the adventure of trust and commitment to another person. Or he might have added, another personal being. You do not know another person, he goes on, except when both of you are willing to enter upon that adventure of trust and commitment. All knowledge involves commitment and risk. Here, in the knowledge of another person, a new dimension of knowledge opens up. And of course, as he puts it around the same time, in a book published in this country, Honest Religion for Secular Man, we know God as he reveals himself to us, going back to his uh, initial observation. There is no other way to the knowledge of persons. Now, if Newbegin takes that middle position, he also makes it corporate. Okay? So our knowing is not just an individual knowing, as modernity or the enlightenment paradigm suggested. Neither is it a kind of individualist, subjective um, agnosticism, if you like, about what can be known and what uh, could be known. For Newbegin, this knowing is always within the context of community. We come to know things because we live in the knowledge with which we've been apprenticed, um, or in which we are being apprenticed. Um, okay. Um, so, take this quote from um, uh, a publication in the 90s. We believe and confess, he says, that there is a true story that gives a clue to the meaning of the whole human and cosmic story because God has chosen a people to be the bearer of the meaning of the whole story. This is the story of the, Bi the Bible tells with its center in the incarnation, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, when Newbegin, therefore, comes to think about the postmodern, okay, one of the things he notes about postmoderns is that their um, belief that narratives are always held locally, <clears throat> that truth is socially located, if you like. Um, and actually, one of the interesting things about Newbegin's um, output is that when he comes to address postmodernity, he actually agrees with that assumption, okay? As he puts it, um, there is no exercise of human reason that is not socially embodied, rooted in a tradition that is carried by a language. Oh, we're still struggling to get Leslie back. back okay yeah um, so what um, oh I've gone straight to the end I think yeah here we go um, carried by a language now my own um, research on Newbegin was um, focused in on a particular philosopher that Newbegin used who gave him the kinds of metaphors and pictures that helped him to develop this case and that um, philosopher was Michael Polanyi. Uh, again, put your hand up if you've come across Michael Polanyi. Yeah. Uh, I, would, I would encourage you to read Michael Polanyi. 
he wasn't uh, a Christian, he didn't profess Christian faith. He was a kind of, he described himself as a reluctant deist. But he was a very um, gifted chemist who became a social philosopher when he left Hungary in the 1930s and came and taught in Manchester. And perhaps his best known book is this one, which is quite long, it's quite an intricate book, um, Personal Knowledge Towards a Post-Critical Philosophy. And Polanyi's starting point is that he wants to, like Newbegin in a sense, occupy that center ground between modernist objectivism and postmodern um, uh, agnosticism, I suppose you'd call it. Now, Newbegin first came across Polanyi in the late 50s, and his friend J.H. Oldham had encouraged him to read Personal Knowledge, and this was the book that Newbegin read, he said, every decade for the rest of his life. Um, and indeed, I was involved in reading some parts of it to him for the umpteenth time, it seemed. So, what is Polanyi's point? Polanyi's point is that actually knowledge is personal because it involves our intuitive grasp of what the nature of the world is. It's personally owned. We invest ourselves as people in the way in which we understand the world. And when we accept a certain set of presuppositions, says Polanyi, and use them as our interpretive uh, framework, we may be said to dwell in them as we do in our own body. Now, that way of knowing is passed on within traditions of knowing. That way of knowing is developed from the very earliest years as we trust people who are mentors to us, our parents, our educators. And much of this knowing, says Polanyi, moves from what initially is a kind of focal awareness of what's going on into a, an awareness which is indwelt. So it's always moving in this cycle of focally being aware of something, learning some new things, and then occupying that assumption as a set of, a, as an interpretative framework as he describes it here. So he says, um, all knowing is personal knowing. It's participation through indwelling. Now, Polanyi takes that in a number of different directions, um, but he describes that process by means of what he understands the scientific community to be about. So Polanyi tells us that the scientific community is precisely a community which sits in the middle ground, which lives in a set of presuppositions and assumptions, but which has intuitions about the nature of reality, which far exceed its own boundary condition, if you get what I'm saying. So knowledge in a scientific community is socially located, but the impact of that knowledge has, as Polanyi puts it, universal implications. So, for Polanyi, the scientific community is an example of a community which is um, not pluralist. Well, it's pluralist in one sense, but it's not caught in a pluralist kind of imprisonment, just caught up in its own narrative without the ability to say things to people and institutions outside of it. It's actually all the time discovering from its own reality and life uh, the way in which successive generations of scientists are apprenticed. It's discovering things about the nature of the whole which it publishes. So he says, by trying to say something that is true about a reality believed to be existing independently of our knowing it, all assertions of fact necessarily carry universal intent. So and he takes a number of examples. He looks at some of the great scientists whose work actually began with a hunch about the nature of the world, an intuition, and then was tested through publication, through experimentation, and so on and so forth. Now, even by saying that little bit about Polanyi, you can begin to see why, for Newbegin, Polanyi becomes a great ally in this quest. Because for Newbegin, what Polanyi calls the scientific republic is, for Newbegin, exactly what the church is. It's a tradition-bearing, knowing community. And it's passed from generation to generation. It carries 
the good news of Jesus Christ. It carries the knowledge of God. It carries the life of the Spirit in a way which is, yes, socially located. All of this knowing is socially located. And in that sense, Newbegin wants to agree with the postmoderns. But he parts company with the postmoderns when they say, well, actually, that's just your take on things. Newbegin says, this is a take which actually bears upon the nature of the whole. It has, in Polanyi's language, universal intent. So, says Newbegin, our message is not uh, an in-house message. It's one that needs to be proclaimed. It's to be put into the public space, to be defended, to be argued, to be tested, if you like, to see whether it's the best way of understanding the way the world is. And Newbegin's apologetics, in one sense, is a form of presuppositionalism where he's inviting people to come and see things through the lens of the scriptures to see whether they do not make more sense of the world we live in. Okay. So that's the way that um, this sort of central area works for New Begin. This kind of corporate epistemology, this idea of traditions carrying the faith, which is socially located, but which bears upon the nature of the whole. So Newbegin says, my faith is my personal faith. Yes, so it's bounded by my, in one sense, by my subjectivity. But it's not simply subjective. It goes into this middle ground that Polanyi wants to identify. It's that integration of the subjective and the objective which bears upon a much greater whole, which is at the heart of Newbegin's um, strategy, if you like, or understanding of what's going on. So, just to finish with, three things that I think are significant for Newbegin in the context of the age we find ourselves in now. Number one, witness is born from within the revealed tradition. So he says, this personal commitment, my Christian commitment, is, as Polanyi says, with a universal intent. It is made in the belief that this is the way to grasp reality more truly, not just that it is what I personally prefer. It is made in the faith that what is shown as truth is truth for all. And if it is indeed what I believe, it will prove itself so by opening the way to fresh discoveries and fresh coherences and fresh clarities. Okay. So Newbegin's conception of the church is not that we have arrived as yet. Okay. We don't possess the truth. We bear witness to the personal revelation of God and it leads us into the kinds of language that Polanyi is very used to using. Commitment, excitement, risk, adventure. Yeah? This is what Christian faith is all about. But that witness is born from within the revealed tradition. So, what do we say about it? Yes, Christian truth claims are socially located. To that extent, Newbegin agrees with the postmodern uh, exposition of that theme. But on the other hand, they are also at the same time universal. They have universal implications. And that's how scriptural witness works. So secondly, he understands the church, and this is a phrase that many have come to understand from New Begin, the church as the hermeneutic of the gospel, as the bearer of the knowledge of God. It becomes the process whereby that knowledge is interpreted to those who come into its orbit, as it were, or to those with whom we have contact. Um, he says, how can the strange story of God made flesh, of a crucified saviour, of resurrection and new creation become credible for those whose entire mental training has conditioned them to believe that the real world is the world which can be satisfactorily explained and managed without the hypothesis of God? There's the modernist assumption. And we could add the postmodern polarity as well. He says, I know of only one clue to the answering of that question, only one real hermeneutic of the gospel, a congregation which believes it. There is no other hermeneutic of the gospel. Now that's, if you like, an example of a corporate epistemology. Um, I would go so far as to say that actually that kind of knowing, which is intuited by others who come into the frame of the tradition-bearing community of faith, often discover the reality of it in what we would describe as the kind of cracks between the formal things that actually happen. It's in the spaces, it's in the relationships, it's in the, the posture, it's in the, the bearing of people who've 
begun to understand more about what this means, that people come to know faith. We had a woman in, in our church. Um, I go to a very unusual church. I won't say which one it is. Um, and occasionally we have a kind of, you know, we pass the microphone around. And about uh, a couple of years ago, a woman received the microphone. She said, well, I don't quite know how this has happened, but I think I've discovered God by coming here. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't a, I could point to this, 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 and this. It was something about, you'd have to talk about words like hospitality. You'd have to talk about energy within the group. You'd talk about the bearing witness to Jesus Christ of the group. But it wasn't, none of these things she said, that was what really clinched it for me. It was just the sense that this community was interpreting the good news of Jesus Christ in a way that she could, she could understand. So, church is hermeneutic of the gospel. You could talk more about that. Um, but I also think in terms, and let's return to our theologizing. Um, I think number three, Newbegin um, suggestively, I think, navigates a faithful pathway beyond modernist theologies. Okay. I think Newbegin is without doubt a post-foundationalist in the sense that he doesn't want to argue towards the good news of Jesus Christ from any other place than the revelation of God in Jesus Christ itself, if that makes sense. Um, in fact, he puts it this way, um, to look outside of the gospel for a starting point for the demonstration of the reasonableness of the gospel is itself a contradiction of the gospel. For it implies that we look for the Logos elsewhere than in Jesus. Okay. So that in, one, in one way, if you're familiar with this kind of language, that's quite a, um, a philosophical statement. It's quite a Bartian statement, actually. You know? That the only, the only place where we can bear witness to, and the only place where we can be, is not somehow on a neutral space outside of, or exterior, to the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. It is actually by meeting God in Jesus Christ and beginning to do theology from the inside of that, what Newbegin describes as revelational encounter. That's the only way that we can do theology. That, I think, is one of the most, I can say, um, stretching assumptions to think through as a theologian um, and, and, and continually be asking ourselves, how, how am I doing this stuff? Yeah. Am I, am I doing theology as a kind of second-order activity which has some bearing upon the gospel? Let's use that phrase. But I'm not sure how it relates to that. That's, is it second-order? Or how do I do theology which, which actually moves from the place of the gospel itself and then moves out? That's where the real work starts. So Newbegin would argue that very strongly. Um, it's a great, I think, um, liberation to find that what we, we took maybe under modernity to be the really strong a priori starting point for all our theological quests turns out to be, in Newbegin's understanding, uh, a form of idolatry. Yeah? Form of idolatry, I go that far. That, there's something to chew on and think about. So, what can be known? Um, Newbegin majors on this personal knowledge, and Polanyi becomes a very natural ally to him in exploring some of the meaning of that, uh, meanings of that. But also we could put it this way, what can be known, he's very committed to the reality of the truth-bearing community of the church, which is how Christianity has been carried and spread from the beginning of time. So he's inescapably ecclesiological in his focus but it's not a kind of cozy in-house church-centric kind of view of ecclesiology. It's, it's church called into being always for the sake of the world. So we bear witness to the one who's called us in order to become uh, witnesses to the reality with universal intent, as he puts it. Now, I think that whole way of thinking about theology and thinking about church, thinking about philosophy, thinking about knowing epistemology, 
um, is right at the heart of Nubian stuff, and I think it's, it's, it's very, very relevant to the kind of times that we live in. Uh, and in this, and in a number of other ways, I think Nubian is quite prophetic when he wrote um, 30 years ago about the kind of stuff which now I think is still both relevant but really, really challenging to us as those who seek to be faithful in our theologizing. So with that, I finish. Thank you. Mm. Thank you.